say, reporting Jesus, he said, if you get married and divorced, you're committing adultery. If you marry somebody else. No exception. That's the ideal. That's the standard. Marriage is insoluble. You go outside marriage, you're committing adultery. We assume that it would have been understood that the exception that Jesus gives, only recorded in Matthew, would be implied there. It's the best I can do. I don't know why Luke and Mark didn't mention it. They wanted to make their point as simply, I suppose, and clearly as they could. So I won't turn to those passages and look at them, but it's absolutely clear. Marriage is insoluble. What God has joined, don't let anybody dare pull apart because if they do, they're inviting people into adultery, and a no adulterer can enter the kingdom. Paul says. So no. don't let anyone, even the church. Let no the man. This is the ideal. God is an idealist. He wants it done right. I see that. So let me just read you then the version in Matthew from translation that I have here. It's, it's nothing problematic at all. But see if this isn't clear. We're in Matthew chapter 19. Background to this is that we know from Jewish writings there were two schools of thought here, inevitably. The school of Hillel, famous rabbi, was very free on the right of a man to divorce his wife. If he didn't like something about the change of wife was in order. The school of Shammai was stricter. They basically said that only an illicit sexual relationship outside the marriage would justify a divorce. That's the background. And so it's very real in the story of Matthew 19, where Pharisees, those were the people's leaders, not the ones in charge of the temple, but the people's religious leaders. Many of them were part-time, they weren't all full-time teachers, but they were their guides and, and pastors, so to speak. So some Pharisees, I'm reading here in Matthew 19, what verse is that? Some Pharisees came 23. testing him. 23? 23? Verse oh, three. three so. Verse 3. Mm -hmm. They came and tested him, and they asked this. Now Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any and every ground? argue about that question is perfectly plain. They're, they're asking about the, the free school of Hillel. Is Hillel right to say that you can have a divorce for anything you please, on any and every ground? Jesus asked them in return, I like the New English Bible here, haven't you ever read that the Creator made them from the beginning male and female? Jesus answers notice with scripture. The ultimate word is from God in scripture. And then Jesus added this. For this reason, a man is to leave his father and mother and to be made one with his wife. And thus the two will become one flesh. So to speak, one person. We know they're two persons, but they're so united as to be practically one person. It follows, Jesus said, that they are no longer two individuals, they are one flesh. Good translation. Now, you know that they are two individuals, but you have no difficulty understanding the point here. What God has joined, Jesus finished here, what God has joined together, man must not separate. Now, do we need an army of theologians to discuss this? I hope not. Now, this is a believing a Christian couple. Let's make that point again, that Jesus no. is referring to here. No. He's not talking about that. No? He's talking about divorce. Nothing about Christians or non-Christians. He's simply establishing the rule. Right. Paul, of course, does deal with a later situation where you have Christians, mixed marriages and not. Jesus is simply stating in answer to what is the biblical view. Right. That's it. But uh, just but Paul's uh, expansion. Yeah. Uh, doesn't it tell us that 
when you go back to Jesus, Jesus is referring to a Christian couple? No, Jesus is just answering the Pharisees question that marriage is marriage is marriage. Because, is because, in, because Paul uses uh, the first example, right, in reference to a Christian couple. Of course. Right? Mm -hmm. And then he talks about mixed marriages. Yes. But Jesus obviously didn't deal with no, mixed didn't marriages, deal with, so... No, no. This, this topic is quite clear. This is just by marriage. Implication. All marriage. Wouldn't matter if they're mixed uh, unbelievers, they're all sinning like crazy if they get divorced. Paul has then to, as you said, detail extra things. Jesus is not concerned with that at all. He's making the major point that whoever you are, you better stay together if you're married. Period. That's what the Bible says. Beautifully simple. As you rightly said, Paul then has to unpack that a stage further. But Jesus did give one exception. Yeah, you're going to see in a moment. Mm -hmm. So having stated that wonderful ideal, which is crystal clear, the Pharisees, in their sneaky, nasty way, because they were not keen on Jesus, they said, I got you, Jesus, because you just contradicted Moses. You see? Aha! Uh -huh. Now I gotcha. You surely agree that Moses was God's spokesman, don't you? Jesus knew that. He knew about Moses. Gotcha. You see how nasty and hostile they were? Why then they objected? Did Moses, the great Moses, lay down the demand that we a man might divorce his wife? The demand, they said. Moses commanded that a man might divorce his wife and give her a note of dismissal. That's to say, a formal document to make it signed and sealed, done and dusted. Jesus, our rabbi, is well up to these stupid pharisaical objections. He answered, it was because of your mind, because your minds were closed, your hardness of heart, because you were so stubborn and resistant that Moses gave you permission, he didn't command it. He made a concession to your madness. Wickedness. Wickedness. Because you people have always been so resistant to God, Moses then regulated your wrong divorce, you see that? To make it easier in view of your stubbornness and your willingness to divorce, Moses mercifully gave a permission to regulate divorce. Actually, as one commentator point, points out, this was re really regulating adultery. It was adultery to divorce. But to ease the situation, here's what we're going to do. I'll give you permission at least to make it a documented thing. You can't just do it and, and move on your way. You've got to give a certificate and divorce. But, Jesus said, it was not like that from the beginning. That was not what God intended. Not, not, not what God intended. This was a temporary permission and concession. Now, Jesus, of course, implies that the new covenant which he is inaugurating and giving the teaching of is going to supply the necessary spirit that wasn't available in the same way somehow. And so we're now moving into a different key altogether. It wasn't like that from the beginning, but this is the way it's going to be now, from now on. And I tell you, he says, here Jesus then makes his proclamation, if a man divorces his wife, for any cause other than that of unchastity, which presumably means sexual deviation, and marry somebody else, he's marching right into adultery, and adultery excludes you from the kingdom of God. We know that from Paul. How difficult is that? Clearly, Jesus does away with the Mosaic concession in view of the new covenant, which is full of spirit, because Jesus, the risen spiritual person, as he later became, is empowering us now. In view of that, then, only when the sexual bond is irretrievably broken, it, you don't have to divorce even then. It can be forgiven. But should it not be forgiven, then 
you do have that right to divorce, presumably for that irretrievably broken sexual union, in which case the injured party, I suppose, is okay to marry again. I, I, the best understanding, I think, would be that if you're divorced, you're not married. If you're divorced for good cause, this one cause that he gave, then you're not married. Okay, question. so let's take a question. Please. Is, is it correct that this, um, this act by Moses yes. was an act of, of compassion because the women were being yes. just taken in and dismissed Absolutely. for any, any cause? Absolutely. And, and he, in yes. compassion, yes. put a stop to that. I'm sure that's right. He, as the commentators say, he regulated mm. it for the mm. sake of the injured parties who were being indiscriminately dismissed and so on. He regulates it by requiring at least a certificate, right? And he does say that in Deuteronomy 24, it's the only reference we have to this. He says if it's, if it's for some unseemly thing, you can divorce. It's not clear what that It doesn't matter for us today, because we're not trying to sort out what Moses allowed anyway. Jesus has ever, ever written that. But whatever that was, yes, exactly right. Out of compassion for the chaos that they're causing, and of course, the whole thing resulted from their intransigence, their hardness of heart, and their wickedness. Just a small point here. Yes. This is another example of corporate thought that you were talking about. He so. doesn't say because of their heart. He told the Pharisees because of your heart. Good point. Mm. Oh, that's your good. Answer. Good point. Mm. Wow. Mm. You and all your wicked brood. Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, just a comment online. Yes. yes. Can you comment on a situation where, where certain pastors uh, break up marriages, or no, I should say compelled people who have been divorced to get back together? Can you well, that, that? that's, yes, I mean, that's obviously a different situation where you have, a, you're forming a church, you're having people come to your church, and people come as having arrived at their third marriage, let's say. They've been divorced twice, right. 25, 30 years ago. <coughs> There's nothing in the New Testament which suggests that they were ever in the business of splitting up existing marriages I prior think, to becoming Christian. I think the question is about reconciliation, though, because we do have commandments to reconcile. You mean yeah. if they're not remarried, they're just divorced? Right. Is that what you mean? Right, but, okay. but the question... The, if they're not remarried, then... Yeah, is that some people... Right. Mm -hmm. they, they go, well, you know, the scriptures teach reconciliations, but you should get back with your, yeah. with your spouses, although they're probably not even in that church or whatever. We've got, we got to be very careful with the language. You're right. Paul's going to deal with that. Right. We'll get to Paul now, having dealt with Jesus. It's quite clear. Later on, then, Paul has to face this in Corinth, and he does it beautifully. He discusses marriage, and he says, in view of the tough times we're in, it might be better not to be married. But if you marry, that's fine. He makes no law. But when he gets to 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 10 and 11, he says, I'm now giving you a command from Jesus. I didn't make this up. Now, I believe every word of Paul, as we have it, is, is authority in Scripture. But he reinforces that authority by saying these are the very words of Jesus, and no doubt he knew of what Matthew had recorded. He knew all that. So here we go in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10. To the unmarried, and to widows. Those would be people who have never been married. Or maybe divorced and remarried. They're not married. They're unmarried. <laughs> and to widows whose husbands have died. I say this. It's a good thing if they stay as I am, self so, so, single. But if they cannot control themselves, then get married. Better to be married than burn with desire. Let's not argue about that. That's perfectly clear. In view of the difficulty of the times, might be better to be single. But if you're married, that's fine. He's, it's wonderful, a balanced statement. So then, to the married, I give this ruling. I'm reading from any being. I'm nicely translated. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. Key. In two verses, Paul gives the instructions. To the married, I give this ruling. He's talking about Christians now. Because in the next verse, he says, let's talk about mixed marriages, where you have a believer and an unbeliever. 
But here you have two believers. To the married, I give this ruling. Now they could have become Christians together, right? One could have become a Christian, then the other became a Christian. But whatever it is, they are now married, and they're both believers. Okay, can I just read my translation here? Because it's always right. Now, for those who are married, I have a command, not just a suggestion. And it is not a command for me, for this is what the Lord himself has said. Of course. Okay, so that, that, right. that's fine. Yes. Now, that's the, exactly right, but every translation says that, which is not mine, but right. the Lord Jesus. Right. But can I make my point? Yes. The reason I said earlier that Jesus is speaking about Christian couples mm. is because Paul goes back and takes Jesus' prohibition mm -hmm. uh, or, or uh, rules or standards for marriage and puts it in a Christian-only mm. You know what I'm saying? I Environment. Do. Of course. And then you but then he talks about... It. So what That's Jesus right. said, it relates to Christian couples only as as used, uh, as it is used by Paul. You, you see but, my point? But, yes, but the major point is that in verse 12 he says, now let me talk about mixed. Right, right. Well, but that's... That's why we know he's talking about non-mixed here, right? This is Christian. No question. Very easy. Right, but you said no. Jesus is just making a, a yes, he is. The general, general statement, not oh. not, a, not a Christian only statement. Well, but he's Paul not is saying that it, it, it applies to the whole wide world eventually. Mm -hmm. You know, marriage is marriage is marriage, and so Jesus doesn't sort of no, be, no, because <laughs> then the, we we come to the exceptions of of divorce where there is divorce allowed. Jesus gave that exception. No, no, and then Paul gives other exceptions. Well, he gives another exception, which is desertion, right. Mm -hmm. That's true. There is more here, and it comes from Jesus, who chose not to, to say a word about the detail, but simply states the insolubility of marriage. I like that. Mm -hmm. Now Paul, then, is also speaking for Jesus. So, to the married I give this ruling, which is not my, is not mine, it's not my ruling, mm -hmm. But it's the Lord Jesus. So here's Jesus saying then some more in addition to what he said before. A wife then, a Christian wife, must not separate herself from her husband. That's exactly what Jesus said. Right. Which is right. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Mm -hmm. Matthew 19. Mm -hmm. There must be no separation from her husband. But if she does, supposing, alas and alack, a Christian wife, and I think a husband also, because they're reversible situations. All of Paul's discussion here goes in both directions. Mm. So one of these two in a Christian marriage separates. Here's what she or she must do. He or she must do. She must either remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. That is perfectly plain. She must remain mm. unmarried. Well, in light of that, then, wouldn't it make more sense that in verse 10, a wife must not divorce, and then in verse 11, but if they separate, so wouldn't it make sense to use different words to make it clearer that the Lord Jesus himself said, don't divorce, mm -hmm. verse 10, but then if you separate, it's not divorce, he's obviously, obviously talking about. So, because translations, see, usually have just the one word. Uh, some even have divorce in both in both cases. It, it, they should not divorce, but if they divorce, so it, it confuses. The, but the first instance is divorce, and the second, in verse 11, is not divorce, it's separation. Is that right? Well, it's not that hard, because if, if she should separate, this is a married couple, Christian couple, Obviously, hmm. she's not legally divorced because she's told to get back to her husband. She's to remain single, hmm. unmarried. Why? Because she's really married to her husband, obviously. Right. What she mustn't do is to marry someone else. That's not an option. She has either to remain in her single state or get reconciled to her husband. And then it says, and the husband must not divorce his wife. I get it. Uh, how much clearer could you be? She's not to separate, but if she does, then she's to say, to say unmarried. Mm -hmm. You see, the, the problem with unmarried in English, or any language, is, is 
You can equivocate. You can get in a muddle over it. You can be unmarried because you've never been married in your life. You could be unmarried because you've been divorced. You could be unmarried because you're separated and not remarried. Mm. You see, the, you see, the, the, the devil is very clever, by the way. But, but he just equivocates on that word unmarried. Just to go back to the issue here is that. And, and I'm looking at the Greek, and, and Paul is using the same word in a different form. So in the first instance of this word translated separate, mm -hmm. it's koristen. Ko yeah. well, ko yeah. And the second one, which also translated usually separate, is koriste. Ko ko yeah. so, so again, the, the issue is that the first instance is divorce. No. He, he's referring to divorce, no. Paul. There's no divorce. Do not divorce. No divorce. Separating. Separating, separating. In 710? In 710, he got from the Lord himself mm -hmm. what commandment? Don't mm -hmm. divorce. Mm -hmm. Right? From Matthew, we just read that in Matthew 19. Mm -hmm. There's nothing about divorce. It's separating here. To the man that gives this ruling, which right. is not that. You must not separate. You must not separate. Right. Much less divorce. Right. But Jesus was talking about divorce, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. So the issue here, the model here that people are creating for themselves yeah. is that maybe the second appearance of, of that word it is not divorce as such, but it's a separation. It is a separation. In this passage, Carlos, it's nothing about divorce. The very thing you mustn't do is divorce. So what did you separate? So that's all. Without divorce. But which is which is where Matthew 19, and we were talking about divorce all the time, right? Yeah, of course. So what do you mean 710 is not about divorce? It's not, it's about separation. But if so what did Paul separate. get from the Lord himself, not Matthew 19? <laughs> He's then. dealing with this <coughs> Christian couple here, as living in his expansion. That's just to create something of a model. Now, if she separates, you could argue that it could be separates herself, or separate, sorry. Oh, if okay. she separates, yeah, or thanks. is separated. That's slightly... It, it, we don't know. The reason for the separation, we don't know. We don't even ask. Why did she separate? Because she chose to? Because her husband kicked her out or something? I don't know. It doesn't matter. If she separates, mm -hmm. she's still married. She's not divorced. Mm -hmm. If she's divorced by this separation, then she's free to remarry. That is absolute nonsense in this passage. Remarriage is not an option. So here's how the words would be in plain English. To the married I give this ruling, which is not mine, but the Lord Jesus. A wife must not separate herself, or if you like, she must not be separated. The cause of that separation we don't know. But if she should be separated, or separates herself, whatever it was, if by some unfortunate circumstance she finds herself apart from her husband, she's to remain Unmarried. That means she's not divorced, is it, Blair? Right. So what some have tried to do here is to say that in the Roman law of the time, if you're separated, you're automatically divorced. In the Roman law. All you have to, to get a divorce, what do you do is move out. That is precisely what Paul has to fight, and Jesus would have fought also. Well, Jesus fights it here, and it's still Jesus. So she must remain unmarried, meaning unmarried to someone else, right? She mustn't get married to someone else, or else get reconciled to her husband. And I love the way that he then says the husband must not divorce his wife. There's no question of divorce here, absolutely not. Bottom line is, Christians, true believers, do not have a right to divorce except when? When their mate dies. <laughs> And he said that in Romans 7, by the way. We all know, he said, that a woman is bound to her husband until death to us part. That's very good. You, you know what's so, interesting about that reference? Mm. And that's uh, verses 39 and 40. Of it's what? Of this same chapter. Oh. Uh, yeah. Paul okay. says, though, so if, if the spouse dies, yes. then she may remarry of again. Of course. But then it's interesting in verse 40. Paul says, but in my opinion... She'll be happier to stay single. And I think I am giving you counsel yes. because I good counsel because I have the spirit of God too. Yeah. 
<laughs> he's so funny. But he's not condemning yeah. marriage. But right, but his opinion, opinion is, uh, you know, absolutely. stay single. If you, want, if you want to start reality, be forced in Romans 7, what does he say there? In Romans 7, let's read this. Romans 7. Don't you know, brothers and sisters, that I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he's living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law. So then, if while her husband is living, in verse 3, she's joined to another man, she'll be called what? An adulteress. But if her husband dies, then she's free from the law. This is Romans 7, verse 3. So she's not an adulteress, though she's joined now. That's, I mean, how easy is that? Of course. Right. That's the insolidarity of marriage. Mm. But as you rightly said at the end of the same chapter in, Corinth, in Corinthians, you can get married again if your spouse dies, but it better be in the faith. I thought that was the point you were going to make. No, I mean, the, the, I think it's just... Yeah, I mean, that goes without saying, but uh, Paul's... Uh, Opinion here is, yes. is, in, is a funny one because he yeah. says, but you know, my opinion is stay single. Yeah. <laughs> Although you can't remember, but okay. <laughs> and don't have, don't I have the spirit of God too? Of course, he does. <laughs> and the spirit of God it's is the spirit of Jesus, and so yeah. there's freedom there. Make your choice. But there's no choice for the Christians should they be separated, not divorced, not, not, not divorced. Should they be separated, then they're not to marry someone else. Um, just okay. a question here, Anton. So, sorry to upset you. Uh, can, can you speak to Malachi 3? Oh, okay. Uh, Malachi 2? 3. Malachi 3. I'll just mm -hmm. read it to you. It says. <coughs> uh, this is from TJ. Mm -hmm. Yes. God hates the voice. Yeah, I think it's the. Malachi your words have been. Your words have been hard against me, says Yahweh, but you say, how have we spoken against you? Yeah. You say, it is vain to serve God. Mm -hmm. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before Yahweh of hosts? Yes. And now we call the arrogant blessed. I think you want two. Jesus. Evil doers do not only prosper, but they... She gave me I think she's verses. referring to Malachi 2. I think she meant two, the same verses, 13 on the... Yeah. Two. Okay, is that is that it, TJ? Uh, God hates divorce. Just check. Two eighteen. Yeah, if you can speak to that. Two. Yep, she's right. Yeah. Absolutely right. That was really sorry, folks. This is Malachi two. Two eight. Uh, TJ has kindly referred us to two fifteen. Well, actually, she's saying two thirteen to Let's seventeen. Let's there. There's another thing you do. This is God speaking to these hard-hearted Israelites. Mm -hmm. You cover the altar of Lord, the Lord's tears with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accept, accepts it with favor from your hand. So you know, you're, you're crying out of the fact that God will not accept you. Yet you say, for what reason? I don't understand why God won't, won't hear me. Well, here's the reason. Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. TJ, how excellent that you brought this in. These people are being severely reprimanded by God. Rightly so, because they are disregarding the marriage covenant. So there's no good weeping and praying and groaning. That's not going to get you anywhere until you recognize the real fault which God spells out here. Fifty. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. That's to say, nobody's kept the covenant who has the Spirit, that's a little difficult. But what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offering? Difficult material. Take heed then to your spirit. Let no one deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. That's clear. That's quite clear. You have wearied the Lord with your words. You have worn God out. This is 16 and 17. <coughs> you have worn God out with your words. Yet you say, you keep arguing with God. 
How have we wearied him? We don't understand this. What do you mean we've wearied God? Well, here's the answer. In that you say, everyone who does evil is good. <laughs> right. Everyone who is doing evil is good. That's what you're saying in the sight of the Lord. And God loves them all, delights in them. Or you say, where's the God of justice? Why doesn't he intervene and do something? So, back to 16 then. For I hate divorce. Some translations have tried to avoid this. They're unhappy with it. The Hebrew is perfectly clear. I hate divorce, says the Almighty, the Lord, the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously by divorcing the wife of, your, of the covenant. That's very clear. I hate divorce. That's the background then of Jesus' strong words. Presumably, he hates divorce because you're breaking the covenant you made. You're dealing treacherously. And then you have the gall to say, why doesn't God deal with Answer me. And you say, well, I don't know what we've done wrong. Nice conversation between these two. Right. Oh, no, no, no. What have I done wrong? You know, why doesn't God hear me? Well, wait a minute. You've just done the very thing I hate. You've divorced your wife. Now look at the children. Any problems with the fact that you've got children all over the place from several marriages? Deal with it. Yes, we can be forgiven. Yes, of course, those awful mistakes we make are forgiven and can be forgiven. I see that. But don't underestimate the chaos that you have produced by your various marriages. We can all say that. None of us can say, aren't we pure in the sight of God from our birth onwards? Absolutely not. But this issue of breaking up families and single parents, unwed mothers, is huge and is leading to the ruin of our nation. Right? Always will do. So I think the lesson we're getting here is that we've got to get this marriage thing right. And to young people who are not married, I would say be very careful in the choice you make. Mm. Get some good advice. First of all, sex belongs only in marriage. That's one of the basic Bible, old-fashioned views. Secondly, the person you married had better be carefully chosen with some advice, not just the impulse of your heart. That's clear. Then, with a stable marriage and a stable Christianity, you have your children within the nest. Isn't that rocket science? You know, a, a, a parallel, if I could yeah. say it is yeah. a parallel, would yeah. be like going from job to job. Like, yes. you know, you, you're not stable. People are not going to employ you if you, you know, Jumping you're around. unfaithful to this job for, oh, I just don't go, go to the next. And I mean, uh, just a comment yeah. by Randy here. Yes. Divorce is not permitted for any married couple, Correct. believer or not. Jesus goes back to the original intent of marriage. Yes. But the unbelievers, of course, don't care what God has that's to say. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And that's, that's as well put, Randy. Could you read that comment again for us, please? Divorce is not permitted mm -hmm. for any married couple, mm -hmm. believer or not. Mm -hmm. Jesus goes back to the original intent of marriage. Yes. But the unbelievers, of course, don't care what God has to say. That's that's very helpful. He, he's, he's unraveled. What, what we didn't deal with so well. Jesus makes the ultimate statement. However, what happens when an unbeliever decides to disregard what Jesus says? Then Paul and Jesus have to legislate for that condition. Right? I see. That's, that's a very good way of putting it. The absolute statement and standard is in Jesus here. However, what happens then if people don't abide by this. Now Paul deals with that then in verses... I'll just verses. before you move on, uh, another comment yep. here by uh, Shaw. D. Shaw? Yes. If, D. Shaw. If people would be as intelligent mm -hmm. in their choice of spouse mm -hmm. as they are when they choose a car, <laughs> <laughs> there would be many more successful yes. marriages. Yes. Oh, that's that's a excellent. Friend. <laughs> Randy has been most helpful. Our right? mind is, is, is coming, is getting straight here. That's the answer. If somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to do, then you have to bring in another consideration. And that is then dealt with in the verses after where we were just now, in verses 12, 
13. He then expressly says, systematically says, now let me talk about mixed marriages. So 10 and 11 are about unmixed marriages. You cannot have a divorce if you're claiming that both members are believers. That's impossible. You are flat out contradicting the scripture. Why are we so concerned with this? Because if you contradict the scripture at, point, at this point, you're marching right into adultery, flat out. If you want to go into adultery and you persist with that, you're not going to be in the kingdom. That's quite clear. So these choices are irrevocable choices and had better be made right. Okay, so having dealt with the unmixed marriage, two Christians, if perchance there should be a separation, for whatever reason, we don't get all tangled up why it was, if that should happen, then your options are simply to remain separated and unmarried, or of course much better, get pregnant. End of story. That's very, very clear. I hope everybody understands that. Mm -hmm. Now let's deal with the mixed marriages, as Paul does. Should you have the situation that one member is a believer and the other is not? That could happen for a number of reasons, couldn't it? Yeah, one becomes a believer. One becomes a believer after being married. Why not? Yeah. Why not? One becomes a believer. Uh, it could be that a believer had married an unbeliever. That was not ideal. It was wrong. He got himself in that mess. A believer could have married an unbeliever. That happens. It's wrong. It's asking for trouble. But let's suppose that one becomes a believer after they are uh, married. Mm -hmm. Then you have this situation. The believer is not, not, not to divorce his wife. Forbidden. However, if she departs and leaves, then, as one commentary says it nicely, you are not bound to pursue that unbelieving mate across the Roman Empire to keep the marriage together. Is it clear? It's been argued about what the situation is here. And I'll, I'll give you my, my sense, and I, I could be wrong, I don't think so, but he then says that if the unbelieving partner, be it the man or the woman, should leave, the unbelieving one, then the believing partner who's left on his own is not bound. Obviously, we'd like to ask Paul, what exactly do you mean by that? My sense, and I could be wrong here, my sense is that that marriage is over. Some have argued the other way. They've argued that he's not bound in the sense that he's not trying to keep the marriage together, but he still should remain unmarried. I, I don't think that's right, mm. so I only give my opinion here. The, the translation a lot, a lot used is bondage which yes. would make sense if we also look at it in terms of, of the law, the law of Moses, mm -hmm. where, where yes. I, I think um, one of the apostles says we were under bondage, Close. but now we're no longer under bondage, and we're free. Probably free. So the, I think the bondage translation might help it might. bring clarity. It's, it's been argued much. You're oh, obviously free. What we've got then is that there, are, there is one reason there for divorce, as Jesus said, if you have irreversible sexual breaking of the ties. Unrepentant. Now, it's not a command. You don't have to divorce for that reason. There might be a reconciliation, forgiveness, and that can happen. But if that persists without any chance of reconciliation, then that can break a marriage, but only that. The second reason, then, would be where an unbeliever leaves the believer, in which case, presumably, the believer is free to remarry. Of course, the moral of the story is here that you don't believe, you don't, sorry, you don't marry an unbeliever in the first place. So the lesson for us all here is that in the choice of mate, you are, by command of Paul and Jesus, to marry a believer. Of course, then you get into the discussion, what does it mean to be a believer? And that's another topic. But you are not to marry somebody in a different faith than yours. You are not to marry somebody who doesn't believe in God at all. Uh, otherwise, you're simply disobeying Jesus, and you're going to have to pay the consequence of all that. I think that's all we can say about that. Actually, we're only dealing with two passages, so this isn't that complicated. So I'm, I'm again, very thankful to Randy Kasha there for clarifying the secondary law, the secondary principle, which comes in when the first principle is broken, then you have to regulate 
what do we do with the unbelieving believing situation? I see that. That's very good. Okay. Now we're, we're going to, we were going to go to something else, but it's 12 o'clock. Next week I wanted to talk briefly about God being surprised. If you'd like to go this week and do a little homework, Google in, is God ever surprised? And see what you find. Is God ever surprised? Because it shows that we're dealing with a very interesting God, if he is surprised. How can that be, since he's supposed to know everything, absolutely, the next time you blink, he knows exactly what you're doing. If that is so, how could God be surprised? You don't immediately cry, allegory, metaphor, anthropomorphism. Don't throw out one of those long words you probably don't even understand. <laughs> but deal with the text and see what you come up with. Google in, is God ever surprised? And there's a very interesting clergyman out there talking, it's only one page. Uh, it could be that we're dealing with a God who is more interesting than we even understood. So that will be, I think, the topic for next week, God willing. Meanwhile, thank you all for being with us. And I think this is going to be archived, this session, isn't it, Carl? Yep, yep, one is already archived. That's amazing. The Day of the Lord. So you did the Day of the Lord and then... Uh, Mm -hmm. Day of the Lord. Two different topics. Two different topics. Absolutely. We did the Day of the Lord extensively, eschatology, and then we did what we could on divorce and remarriage. All there at the site for your leisure or leisure, whichever way you want. Great, great lesson. Thanks, Bishop. Thank you, Dan. So good to have you out there. Just sorry you don't drive down to Georgia and see us more often, like you've never been once. So do come. <laughs> So we had uh, Jerry. We had oh, this is a this is one of the best uh, uh, nick nicknames or online names yes. ever. It's milk, no sugar, no cyanide. <laughs> oh, good! I don't know who you are. Uh, we like it. We like that name. Yeah. He, he got it. Yeah. So we had Randy, TJ. Uh, uh, Tom Cox, hope you're yeah. feeling good. Bob and Kay, Big Buck, Bob, right. and Iz Isaiah. Isaiah. Oh, yes. Yes. Claudia. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Did you know that for me? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Are we going to close with prayer? prayer? prayer. Who would like to close with prayer? Maybe Sarah could close with prayer. Would you do it for okay. be wonderful. Thank you. Dear Father in Heaven, thank you for this gathering, for the people who were able to be with us online. Pray that you would bless all of them and all of us here. Uh, with our troubles and persecutions that you would help us to endure. Thank you for the teaching, and I pray that um, everything would, would be clear in our minds and that we would continue to study. And I pray for your kingdom to come always, uh, that the troubles of this world would be put to an end finally. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Thanks.